Ready, set, go. Pam, go. Pam Pierce. Hello. Appreciate the invitation, having us over. We're in Portland, Oregon, folks. <laughs> 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 and it's rainy. Welcome. Yeah. Riley Nelson, it's a pleasure to meet you, brother. Nice to meet you, too. Thanks for joining us today. I look forward to picking your brain. Uh, come to find out, here we are, 2,500 miles away from home. We have mutual friends. Yeah, James Skelton. Oh, yeah. Right? <laughs> Who would have ever thought? I thought that was pretty cool. Shout out, James. Shout out, James. Hey, James. Yeah. I'd to meet James, I don't think. No, you, you the, the day that he was on the podcast, you it was your first day. Oh, okay. On the road. I remember that. The All lion right. is filled in. Caitlin filled in for you. She did a great job that day. So, right. what do you guys got going on over here? Well, why are we here? Celebrate recovery. Celebrate recovery. That's right. First off, I would like to know how did you two connect? How did this relationship blossom over the last couple of weeks? And then, like, what was your first impression of Caleb? I ask people that almost every time because I don't know why. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I got a funny story about a, somebody else's first impression that happened a couple of days ago that I'll share with you. Once oh, really? Again. It's yeah. the accent. The accent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm in the process of opening um, the first recovery high school in Oregon. And I consider myself a connector. Uh, I believe that people in recovery have gifts. And my gift is I'm able to connect things. And through social media, um, I like to see what everyone's doing across the country. Yeah. Schools that exist, schools that are thinking about existing. And that's how I found you. And I think you commented on somebody's uh, post and it stood out to me. And so I think that's how I reached out to you. Um, and then you jumped in and said, hey, you know, we're coming your direction. Is this something you'd be interested in sharing with the, the people? Mm -hmm. um, and I love to, because um, I've been in recovery a long time, um, thank God, and um, believe that when you find the strength to be able to talk about it out loud and pay it forward, we, rec we heal, we recover. Um, and I believe it's a gift. And it's a, I have a good friend who calls it a gift wrapped in a funny box. And it is but it's a, a gift nonetheless, and it's an amazing gift. And so I love the connections because it doesn't matter shape, size, color, where you're from. Um, this is something we, a lot of us have in common and we share and we are stronger together. So that's this, how I remember. This dude, this dude lives in a funny box, okay? So <laughs> I do all kinds of weird stuff like that. Like I, I'm always, I, I live by the uh, mantra, you have not because you ask not. Yes. And so I'm just like you know, reaching out to people yes. that probably won't reach back, but yeah, I, I do it anyway. So but I mean, then sometimes they, they do. do yeah, no, I, I believe in it. I, I, it's the reason the school's coming to life here in Oregon. It's the reason the alternative peer group is coming to life here in Oregon, because um, my sister said years ago, uh, Pam, the difference between you and everyone else is you actually have these thoughts and then you act on them. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the worst thing you could do, it, like if I reach out to someone and they don't respond, oh, well, no, I move on. Right. To the, but chances are, when things are meant to be, they do respond. And it's always amazing. It's always perfect. It's always meant to be. And so I so love it. Meaningful but, relationships. That's how they yes, start. Yes. Or just from yes. the, that initial, like, mm -hmm. throwing a line out. That's and right. Seeing what happens, yep. you know. And that's, like, the foundation of my process of recovery. Like, we talked a lot about... Um, the fellowship that I participate in and the different things. But like when I really started like thriving and growing personally is when I began to cultivate these relationships by sitting down and talking to people like you guys yes. and getting to know you guys on an intimate and personal level once, sometimes twice a week for two or three hours. Like who gets to do that? Not many people get to have that kind of opportunity to put the phone down over there, not look at it and really genuinely get to know somebody, somebody that you never met before, somebody that you don't know anything about, somebody that's, you know, and just have that connection. And then as we move along, you know, we'll be able to maintain that along the, along the process. So we're at a campground in Washington state. I don't remember Lake Kai. We're at Lake Kai campground, Washington state. And Caleb has a little early morning routine where he goes to the bathroom. He sits down on the throne <laughs> 
and he types <laughs> and he starts typing up a nice big like his his daily reflection right posts about like what we've done and where we've been and that sort of thing it's a place to be still it's a yeah. place to be still yeah absolutely I kind of don't have a choice and so the showers were also located in that same bathroom and there was a couple guys there was two guys in line in front of me i was waiting my turn to take a shower well hang on before you start let me let me tell you a little bit of a backstory <laughs> that i haven't told yet i walked in there and uh i thought both stalls were taken right and so i'm standing like right outside the stall which is kind of weird if you're in the stall using the bathroom you can see somebody's feet you know just just hanging out like what the heck's going on so he comes out and i go in and so I'm waiting my turn to take a shower. There's two guys in front of me, and he's in, the, he's in there the whole time. And the first guy takes a shower, comes out. Then the next guy, and I'm, next, I'm on deck. I'm next in line, right? And he knows I'm, the, the guy knows I'm waiting. So he comes out of the shower, and he, I was waiting outside on, like, a bench outside of the bathroom. And the guy comes out of the shower, and he turns and looks at me, and he goes, hey, man, there's some sketchy guy in there. <laughs> he's been in there for I don't know how long, but he's acted weird. <laughs> and I'm just like, I knew it was him. I knew exa they were exactly that they were talking about him. I was like, yeah, some guy's in there acting all sketchy. You know, I'm just like. You're yeah. like, he's sober. He's good. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's my boy, man. Everything's cool. Yeah. So I've been trying to tell that story for a couple of days, and I keep forgetting to post it on our video, so I had to get it out on this podcast. I'm sorry, Pam. Oh, thanks, Steve. Yeah, you're, sketchy you're, guy. you're more than welcome. <laughs> right. So what are you guys doing here? What, what's happening with this school? What's, what all has taken place over the last, what, two years of this thing coming to life? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, again, Pam Pierce, some person in long-term recovery. Um, Actually, this July will be 24 years that I've been in recovery. Ooh, there you go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the questions I always get asked um, is, how have you done this for 23 years? And the, the thing that always comes to mind is that I've never been anonymous. I've always, I want people to know this is what it looks like and that there's hope and healing uh, if you can just, that first step is a doozy to say, shoot, I think there's a problem. Um, and so again, I've, I've never been anonymous and I've been blessed by that. I have people come out of the woodwork and want to ask questions and talk about it. And I love to talk about it. Uh, and when I speak about it publicly, I always say outside of the birth of my children, it's the thing I'm most proud of. Um, and so two years ago, <clears throat> actually almost four years ago, I was asked to lead a prevention organization locally, and it, the woman who uh, actually founded the organization reached out through social media and asked if we could sit together, and she wanted to talk to me about this organization that she led, and through that, she said, here's the deal. My kids are graduating from high school, and I um, would like this prevention organization to continue and I've gone to the community asking who can do this. And she said, it's you unanimously, who are you? And to me, I believe in signs. I like to follow the signs and mm -hmm. that was a sign. And so um, she said, would you be interested? And uh, of course, yes, I love it because I knew what she was doing inside the high schools and stuff. And I, again, I love it. That's how I remain sober uh, and in recovery. And so through leading this prevention organization, um, I came across a documentary, Generation Found, and you know, thought, thought about it. It's like interesting. It's about a recovery high school. What is a recovery high school? I probably needed a recovery high school. And so just out of curiosity, um, and then the, uh, Greg Williams, who uh, created that documentary, had also created the, the Anonymous People, and I loved that documentary. Because um, again, like him, I always, you know, as a young person in recovery, asked, why are we anonymous? Um, and so I was like, I'm going to take a look at this documentary. And so you had to rent it in a big theater and, and then invite, you know, 50 to a couple hundred people. Um, and so I did so. I brought it to life, and we watched the film here locally. And as I was watching the documentary, uh, I cried the entire time. Um, because I kept thinking, this is so amazing. Either I did it in a different life, or dear God, this is where it's going. 
And, but of course, you know, deep feeler. I, I sat there when the lights went on and looked like I'd been hit by a car, you know, train. Um, and I thought, get yourself together. You got to look normal. And <clears throat> my, one of the co-founders of the school was also in the room. And he and I actually went to high school together. Um, and he stood up and shared his story and said the words, I think we can do this. And from that moment, it has come to life supernaturally. Uh, things have come out of the woodwork. Um, so many people, it's been one of the greatest <laughs> experiences, crying, um, of my life. Um, and so this year, August, uh, Harmony Academy will open. And it will open in my hometown. And the district that is chartering the school is the district that I graduated from, from high school. And when I graduated from Lake Oswego High School, I won Biggest Partier and Best Dressed. Cha-ching. Yep. <laughs> and, uh, and I share that because, again, it, it, it's another example of serendipi you know, serendipitous things that happen. And um, my father was alcoholic, and he passed away when he was 64. <coughs> And when Lake Oswego, the, when the Lake Oswego Administrative uh, School Board unanimously voted in the first recovery high school in the state of Oregon, it was on my father's birthday. And mm. again, that's a sign. Um, and so I sat and cried and thought, 30 years ago or more, uh, when I graduated and you know, thought I was on top of the world, the coolest person in the world because I won Biggest Partier, um, would I have thought in a million years that I would be sitting on the, on the ground on which I was introduced to drugs and alcohol, opening the first recovery high school in the state. So, um, and again, through that process and, you know, joining the associations that lead recovery schools and alternative peer groups and the collegiate level programs, um, we learned how important the alternative peer groups were and so um, that also came to life, and actually uh, the first one opened here locally in May. Um, and we were introduced to Riley Nelson, who's sitting here to my right. Uh, Riley attended Archway Academy, which is the uh, school that the documentary profiled, and he also atten attended one of the alternative peer groups that they talk about in the documentary as well. Um, and Riley was introduced to us about a year and a half ago um, which I believe, again, is another sign. Yeah. Um, God, the universe, knew that something amazing needed to be done in Oregon. And uh, we are the soldiers who are listening. And uh, so here we sit, um, about to watch the landscape change for the better. Um, and so Riley is part of the alternative peer group. And I'll let Riley jump in and share. Yeah, so, so like we were talking before we started about how you just how you ended up in Portland. And so like upon moving here like you didn't know that all this was going on no so i started working at the alternative peer group um so i spent you know from, from in like, houston yeah okay. yeah i spent mm -hmm. from 19 to about 23 working with teenagers with substance use and like other high-risk behaviors so um moving here oregon is actually number 51 if you add in puerto rico as far as like access to mental health and substance abuse treatment and number one in necessity and I didn't know that when I moved here. Um, you know, so moving here, I wanted to do something similar because it, it's what I'm passionate about. You know, I had a lot of issues as a teenager and people were there to help me. So I was just looking for jobs and I was like, there is nothing. What is going on? Um, you were looking for jobs in the field. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. I was looking for jobs in the field. I was looking to work with teenagers. And here we have essentially two uh, inpatient programs for teenagers and we have two outpatient programs for teenagers. And you're talking about a major metropolitan city, yeah. like that's, that's crazy. Um, yeah, so I, I moved here. I just happened to come across Pam somehow. I'm not really sure how that happened. Connector. Um, connecting, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> um, they were looking to start, you know, their recovery high school. And I kind of introduced the idea of like the continuum of care that Houston has. So, um, one of the things that makes Houston so great is like when the kid leaves home, 
to the time that they come back home, they're like constantly in recovery. So they go to school and they leave school to go hang out and do process groups, do family groups, family sessions. Um, and they also have like teenage 12 set meetings. So there there's four alternative peer groups and they all have 12 set meetings and they're all, I mean, all the 12 set meetings have at least like 30 kids. There's one that has like 80 kids in it. Um, you know, and, and it, it's crazy, right? Like, like here you have the average age of AA being 40 years old and you have all of these teenagers in a 12 step meeting. And the only person who is like maximum 25 is the person working in the alternative peer group. Like that's crazy. Um, and so for me seeing this and coming here, uh, I'm also in recovery. I have eight years sober. Um, you know, and for me going back into AA here, young people's, young people's AA, <laughs> and seeing like, <laughs> like, oh my God, <laughs> like these people are as old as my dad. Like yeah. how, how does that work? Um, you know, and I think being able to help Pam and like change the landscape and, you know, change the conversation, I think is, is something that needs to happen in Oregon. Can you talk a little bit about what that progression was like for you? Like leaving the school and working at the APG in Houston? Like what was that, what was that process like for you? Yeah. So, um, one of the things that's great about the APGs is that we have recovery coaches. So um, there are 20 somethings that are like really relatable to teenagers um, that teenagers can emulate. Uh, they sponsor them and like provide them advice about like what's going on and from their personal experience. And from, from my own experience, like being a teenager, like I wasn't gonna listen to some dude in a suit, like that, that wasn't something I would listen to. Um, <laughs> And so for me, like having somebody in a t-shirt with tattoos that's like a little bit older than me tell me, you know, like shut up and listen. I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> whatever you say. Somebody that looks like you, that talks like you, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and that's that's so critical. I mean, you know, it's like it's like a pregnancy. Like if I tell you, you know, like pregnancy is really hard. Like I don't know anything about pregnancy, right? <laughs> yeah. I, you, you, you have no reason to believe that I've ever experienced pregnancy. So versus like somebody like Pam being like, yeah, when I had a kid, like here was my experience with pregnancy. You're like, oh, okay, right, like, sure. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, and so that's what made it so critical, I think, was sort of that component. Yeah. What I love about the alternative peer group model, it, 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 Riley is an example of paying it forward. Mm -hmm. He's a product of it, loved it, feels passionately about it, and goes back in to the environment to lean in and pay it forward. And, and I believe paying it forward is how we stay in recovery and we thrive and, um, I mean, talk about authentic space. We can create authentic space in seconds. And again, I think that's one of the gifts. And so to, again, to be able for Riley to go back into the environment and share what he learned, I mean, that's, those are the principles. Those that's the foundation of, you know, how it works and why it works. Yeah. Right. And so back to your your question. Sorry. Um, yeah, I spent I spent a couple years outside of the alternative peer group, and that that's one of the things that's important is like going out, creating your own recovery, like establishing whatever your adult or young adult recovery looks like, and then coming back. So yeah, sorry, I realized like I didn't answer developing that. some skills out there. Yeah. Right. Yeah, being part of a community mm -hmm. and having some independence and being able to make the choice whether or not to and choosing to. Yeah. I was uh, wanting to see if you would back up for us a little bit, Riley, and, and how did you get into Archway as a student? Can you lead us down that road? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, I did not come into uh, recovery by choice, like most, most teenagers don't. Um, I didn't either. <laughs> what? And elaborate on that. Wait, yeah, I, don't, yeah, I don't think yeah. any of us did. So, <laughs> so I started using, uh, I started drinking when I was 11, uh, graduated to cocaine um, by eighth grade. And then some things happened. I wound up, you know, chugging a bunch of Delsum, staying home from school, skipping like two weeks at a time. My mom thought I was sick. My mom's a really great person. And she's such like a, she believes in like who you are and like believes what you say and I naive yeah yeah well in, in some ways I think she you know she still saw me as like the kid that I was like mm -hmm. and and you know there was a lot of denial and she didn't really want to see like what was going on in some ways and in some ways she actually didn't see it 
uh, she doesn't come from that environment. So for her, you know, recognizing those signs mm -hmm. are, are difficult. Um, yeah, so my mom wound up taking me to the doctor and asking the doctor, you know, I want you to drug test my son. Uh, and it was in front of me. And at this point, I had a, a pretty fun career going, I thought. And I saw that being ruined, and I was very upset. I was like, how dare you? So you he's know. pissed off when that happened? Oh, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I used to have uh, a really bad temper. <laughs> um, and so I was like, how dare you? Um, like, why would you think that? Like, I'm such a good kid, and like, I've just been sick. And, you know, my mom was adamant at that point. Like, she wouldn't look at me, but she was like, yeah, I, we need to drug test him. <laughs> so I did this whole, the runaround, you know, of like, Oh, I don't have to pee. Um, <laughs> How long can we make drag this thing out? Yeah, yeah. Uh, turns out it was it was an hour, which is not that long. <laughs> not, it's not enough time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, wound up doing that, um, and you know, on the ride home, I had before recovery, I had like a, a lot of entitlement. I was very, I've always been really driven, and. You know, I think that, that that was very misdirected into, like, drugs. Like, I wanted mm -hmm. to stay in that. Like, you're going to have to, like, pry it from my cold, dead hands. Like, no fucking way. Sorry. <laughs> Bring it, baby. <laughs> Bring it. <laughs> um, so on, on the drive home, I just kind of broke into this angry rant. I told her, like, I told my mom, like, I was, I'm going to kill you. Like, I'm going to kill my family. And, like, if you take drugs away from me, like, this is what's going to happen. And you need to just let me use and get over it. And all of, it was it was horrible. Um, you know, and she started crying and wouldn't look at me and the car stopped and made a quick U-turn and I was like, where are we going? And she wouldn't look at me. Uh, and then we pulled up to the constable's office and constable, sheriff, it depends where you live, but the police station essentially. And she was like, um, she still wouldn't look at me, got out of the car, walked in and she was like, I want to press charges on my son. Um, and for me, that's really when I realized I... I, you know, fucked up pretty bad. My mom's a great person. She's always been supportive, easily one of the most loving people I know to, to strangers, to anyone, you know, no matter who they look like, who they are, what they look like. She's always like, like, yeah, let me make you food. Like, you know, how mm -hmm. are you kind of thing? Like she knows everybody for years. It's, it's a blessing and, and a curse if you ever want to leave somewhere. <laughs> and there's people <laughs> that my mom can talk to. Um, yeah, and that was the first time I'd ever had the idea that, you know, my mom wasn't going to be there anymore. Like, I had messed this up so bad because of, like, my need to stay using drugs that, like, I'd ruined the best relationship of my life. Um, and so the cop searched through my phone. I used to tell the story that the cop tried to ask me for my passcode, and I was like, no way, like, no, absolutely not. Um, and that I wasn't crying. Uh, I was, like, bawling my eyes out at this point, like, like <laughs> slobbering, and it was, it was, it was gross. Um, anyway, so I just handed him my phone. I'm like, yeah, 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 like, here, here, here. So, so they looked through my phone uh, to, like, find out that I was, like, selling my Vyvanse, and I was doing all these drugs. And um, What was the charge that she... What was the charge they pressed? I mean, they, they well, so she wound up not, but she oh, okay. wanted to press charges for assault because I had like threatened her to like, oh, kill okay. her and my whole okay. family, and <laughs> that you know that that's valid. Um, <laughs> it's real. Yeah. So he wound up looking through my phone, and and the cop looked at my mom, and I was sitting right there, but they were like ignoring me. It was interesting, um, and she was like, the cop was like, so we have two options here. I can take him to jail or he can go to treatment. And um, my mom shrugged and then he looked at me and he's like, what do you want to do? And I was like, uh, I, I like took a second to think about it because I was like, in jail I can probably still use. So there's that. Um, but I don't know, I had, to, I had to make a choice between going to jail or fixing my family life and I think the easy way out in a lot of ways would have been jail like I could have mm -hmm. just been like yeah sure whatever like send me to jail um and it's possible that my mom wouldn't have and she would have backed down and all this stuff but luckily I was like I'll go to treatment um and so they were like well we have you have like an inpatient option the great thing about Houston for adolescents is that my mom had a choice between uh like seven really great options for inpatient outpatient 
you know, semi outpatient PHP, all of them have been long running fantastic programs in Houston. Um, and so they were like, what kind of, where, where do you want to go? And I was like, well, I don't want to go home. Like this is really uncomfortable. And like, I feel bad about myself. Like I'd rather just go to inpatient. Are you still slinging snot and slobber everywhere at this point? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so we wound up, uh, I was like, I want to go to inpatient. Like, I don't want to go home. My mom was kind of uncomfortable. And out of the background, my ex stepdad, I hear him being like, I'm not going to pay for that. And I'm like, all right, so uh, outpatient. <laughs> um, yeah, so we were introduced to this really great program called Teen and Family Services, which um, is an adolescent alternative peer group. And so basically what that means is I walked into the to their building to see like a bunch of kids my age who I was convinced were still getting high because they looked like they were happy in a rehab, uh, which is a very strange looking thing as a teenager to come into that. Uh, and I met with the counselor and I had this idea that, you know, I was going to tell him like my mom, you know, my mom just kind of lost it. Like, I don't really know what's going on or why I'm here. Like I smoked weed once and I had this whole elaborate plan. Uh, so I walk in with this, this great narrative about, you know, all of this stuff and, and I start talking, and he's like, um, I read the police report. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, <laughs> OK. And so he's like, what's really going on? And I start just telling him all, all this stuff. And, and he's, like, he's like, all right, yeah, you need to be here. <laughs> so, well, we got you, yeah, well, yeah. buddy. Welcome. <laughs> and so in my head, I'm just like, fuck. Like, <laughs> fuck. So I walk in, and there are all these kids, like, and I don't know, teenagers are always interesting and, you know, working with them. I, anytime anybody's like, how's your day? I'm like, never a dull moment because that's, mm -hmm. that's true. Um, and so they were like laughing and telling jokes and, you know, acting like teenagers. And, and I was like, which one of you sells drugs? <laughs> um, turns out none of them did. And um, there was a sweet 16 party that I was determined to go to for like this girl that I liked at the time. And and I was like, hey, can one of you take me to the Sweet 16 party? Like, there'll be all these things. And, like, I was trying to entice them. And they're like, no, dude, you should probably stay sober. They sneaked you out? No, no. They, they, they told me straight up, like, no. They're like, you need to stay sober. And then <laughs> I was like, ah. <laughs> Like, so this isn't what this is. Um, yeah, so a around three months, like, I made some really great friends. One of them I, I live with now. We both moved halfway across the country. We're still roommates five years later. Um, and like three months in, I wound up like, like, I want to stay sober. I was this difficult kid, George Youngblood, the, the CEO of Teen and Family always tells stories about how I'm his most difficult child. Um, and that's still a badge of honor. And also I apologize every time I see him. <laughs> um, and, and so I like wanted to stay sober, like the relationships I had made, like the counselors that I had met, what I'd heard other people process and like what I'd been able to process. I was like, I want this. Like, I'm happier. I feel like I have these genuine, like, relationships and connections. Um, and I was at my normal high school, so. And how, how old were you at that time? I was 16. 16 years old. Yeah. We was just talking about this last, last night. night. Yeah, like you were rediscovering and, and building a life that you're proud of, and you wouldn't sacrifice anything for it, you know? Yeah. Right. You just come over this threshold where you're, you come to this point in your life when you're just like, I don't want to ruin what I have going on. Like I'm living my best life now and there's not anything that any kind of substance can add to that. You know what I mean? Like yeah. we literally just had we're this conversation. Driving home last night. We were talking about, we were talking about cannabis. Cause like where we're from, there's not dispensaries <laughs> yeah, on yeah, every yeah. corner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's definitely a cool yeah. shock. That's what we're, so we're just talking we're just like processing through like what, you know, what, what are your thoughts on that? What How would that look like if we that? went into one of these places, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where would that lead to? Like, where Potentially, where could that lead to? We was talking about these things. I want to give your mom a shout out, bro. That's oh, yeah. freaking awesome, man. Yeah, Cindy Kraft, she's a boss. <laughs> <laughs> she's a I've, got, I've got a family member that's acting the same I way. I was thinking about him, too. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so mom, Ruth McCoy, you hear this? <laughs> Take him to the police station. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's so true. You start seeing those behaviors. You start seeing those behaviors, and, and, you know, those that process saved your life, you know? And a lot of times, you know, like when you struggle with 
being an enabler or, you know, the things that you do as a parent, it's really hard to figure out where do you draw that line or where do you take your child to the police station. Yeah. And when it starts coming to, like, taking the car at night when you're asleep or, you know, doing certain things, like, where's that line draw? We just drug drug tested him a couple weeks ago. He passed. But he's got all the behaviors. Like... So I mean, we know that's what's coming. You know, that's what potentially could come next. Yes. I mean, it's a good Slinging snot. Slinging snot. <laughs> well, well, I'm a parent, and I have a 20-year-old, uh, 18-year-old, and 13-year-old. And it's education is important. Understanding what it looks like, understanding your genetic vulnerability. Um, and if you are genetically vulnerable, how many people in your family have it? Because that ups your numbers. Mm-hmm. Um and so, but as Riley, you know, with his mom not having the experience and literally taking a leap of faith that something is wrong. Um, but as a parent, you want like this perfect utopia life for your kid. Mm-hmm. And so there is a massive battle that goes back and forth. And it doesn't have to do with just drugs and alcohol or, you know, but you want them to have this perfect life. And oh, no, oh, we're starting to go over here. I don't want that area. Um, and as a parent, I mean, we're seeing a lot of it right now with entitled. Yes. And pride. Yes. Yes. And you want it so badly for your kid, for your child, uh, like, cause you want to wear it like a badge of honor. Look how awesome. Um, but again, it's changing how we look at substance use disorders. It's understanding it and that it's not an, a bad thing. It just is a thing. Right. It's just, and it'll take, you know, we're starting to see, um, some progress, and it will take a long time for parents to be able to be honest with themselves. I mean, a lot of times when um, substance use disorder does run in families, and so how does a parent, this wasn't the case with Riley's um, mom, but how does a parent, if they're suffering, how do you help your kid? You don't. Right. Yeah. Or another thing, too, is like you said, like a, a parent, One of the hardest things I ever heard my dad say to me was, did I fail you as a parent? You know, he felt like it was his fault for my actions and the way I chose, the path I chose to go down. And uh, so I can, you know, I can relate to that as, you know, for for a parent to be like, where do you draw that line? What do I do with my kid? Then it's like, you know, you wear as a badge of like, well, I created this perfect world. My child is successful, all these different things. And then they look at struggling with mental health, addiction, depression, all these things. Like, like that's failure. But yeah. whenever we can cross that line and be like, it's not failure. It's just a process. It's, you know, it's a circumstance that well, some I, people I always, have to go through. Absolutely. And I look at being human. By definition, that means we're imperfect. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, and it, again, it's, um, it's understanding um, that we all have a little something and it's okay to talk about it. And when we start to talk about it, healing starts to happen, Mm -hmm. but getting there initially is tough. Can you talk a little bit about what you learned and what the, um, those conversations were like with your children? Because much like what Riley shared, like there wasn't anybody that could tell me anything. I was going to, I was going to experiment. I was going to check out all of it right like my parents couldn't have approached me with any there's no tactics that would have worked right like it's just it it wasn't gonna happen my mom threatened me and i was just like (laughs) i don't care well and um my father was alcoholic and he he was very smart he was very charismatic he was very successful and so my you know my experience um it looked okay and I think one of the things, and this has to do with education, is understanding that substance use disorders come in different shapes and sizes. Um, you know, people have, pick your poison. You know, which drug is yours? Which one got you? Even though chances are we've used a lot of them, you know, personally. Um, but, you know, trying to understand your environment and that the, uh, to be able to talk about it openly. And your father, my father, they didn't have, they were doing the best they could. That was absolutely something that was not discussed. You know, if someone was the falling down drunk, we just, everyone at the table just ignores it. Mm -hmm. Um, And that, you know, creates lots of trauma for the people sitting at the tables. 
But again, it's understanding that, like, my father's alcoholism, my father is a binge drinker. That is a strain of alcoholism. Um, you don't have to drink every day. Uh, I could drink once a year, and the amount of chaos that I will create in that one time, it'll take me a year to recover. Um, and so that's the strain my father had. And so, again, the brain can easily rationalize, well, I'm not drinking every day, or I'm not using every day. Well, it doesn't matter. It's consequences, what's happening. Um, and so with my children, I've, I got sober uh, before I was even married. And um, I actually graduated from college and uh, barely. Um, and I decided to move to DC, which was 3,000 miles away. And again, it's textbook. I told myself, oh, I'm going to move. I'm going to start over. I'm going to, because I'm an adult now, I'm going to drink wine. Well, <laughs> I'm really allergic to wine, you know? And we well, um, did break out in handcuffs. Serious. <laughs> Matter of fact, quick story on that. I, um, I moved to D.C. I think I'm so cool. I interned with one of the Oregon senators, bought a car. You know, I'm like, woo, I'm an adult. I can do this. Uh, got a DUI uh, at 9 o'clock at night. Hadn't even gone out yet. Just drinking, <laughs> thinking about it. Blew a 2-1. Nice. 24 years old. <laughs> yep. Um, and that was the beginning of the end. Uh, it was the first time in my life that I actually got stopped and educated on, hey, FYI, what's happening to you is not normal, you know? And, um, and so again, that was the beginning of it, of the end for me. Um, I ended up meeting my husband. Um, we worked together, and I was on a restricted driver's license. And uh, yeah, really glamorous. Um, Did you have the blow machine? In your actually, no, thank God. That was not, in, was not a thing yet. Um, thank God. Um, <laughs> And uh, my husband also comes from an alcoholic home, but his father was a 24-hour day drinker. And so that strain was very upsetting to my husband. And my husband did what you're supposed to do, but he didn't realize it was the thing. But he delayed use. He was so repulsed by his father's behavior that he's like, he, at a young age, he was able to correlate, that drink makes you an asshole, and I don't want it. And so he didn't do it. And he was spared. And my husband is a normal person um, with regards to drugs and alcohol. Um, and so with my own children, uh, my children have never seen the beast up close and personal, thank God. Um, but I, from the moment they came here, um, they've known that they have a mom in recovery. And I talk about it every day. And I get lots of eye rolls like, oh my God, you think everyone. And I'm like, well, damn near. Um, it's in, it's in most people's families. Um, and, uh, so my kids again are 20, 18 and 13 so far. So good. Um, my son who's 20 is in college and he and I go back and forth, play cat and mouse all the time. And he likes to bait me, but I've told him <laughs> if I ever think for a second that you're on the train, I will come for you like the hounds of hell. I'll send him this audio clip. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I won't stop because I know what the end of that story is if you don't get sober. What would you, uh, when you say I'd come for you, what do you mean? What, how would you intercede on, on his life? Like, um, I hope my mom hears this podcast. We, we would, find, you know, again, going through the process, I would probably start with uh, the therapist who runs the alternative peer group here. Um, so the, my son's name is Graham, so that Graham could have an honest conversation because everyone's going to say, I only had two. I only did it once. And it's like, <laughs> cut the shit. We have to, the way that we survive this <laughs> disease is we have to tell the truth. That's right. And there's no shame in it. And we all lie going in. It's like, no, I only drank, you know, on Fridays. Well, it's like, Pfft. yeah, I drank enough on Friday for the rest of my life. Um, and so it would, it would be him being able to be honest with someone so that we can evaluate it. Because again, depending on the drug, how often, blah, 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 you may need help immediately, physically. And you have to be careful with that. And you know, I think the beauty of understanding this disease and meeting people who are also in recovery, I don't think it's ugly that, you're, that you had you know, XYZ drug addiction. I don't look at it like bad. I look at it like, God, you're, you're a hero. You're doing things that are almost impossible to do. 
Um, and so it would just be introducing the, the process to my child, to my son, if that should be the person. Um, and if he needs inpatient, outpatient, whatever it is. It's like we're just doing it. And the good news is after, you know, kind of being in this world for a while, um, they say that should you, a young person, have to find that you need to be in recovery, if you have a parent in recovery, it ups your odds of success. So mm -hmm. that's good news. Um, and I visit with a therapist uh, every other week, and she helps women in recovery. And we were talking about that when I talk about it with my kids, they're just like, oh, God, you <laughs> always. Um, and she said, Pam, wear it as a bat badge of honor. Because, again, like I said earlier, they've not seen the beast up close. And sh she's like, they have no idea, you know, how the things that they've been spared. Uh -huh. um, and a quick story, too, and I'll finish it here. My 13-year-old, when she was 10, um, she's my third child, so I have to, you know, lean in and be, pretend that I'm paying attention. And um, <laughs> she uh, came home from school, and she was in, I think, fifth grade, and she said, hey, Mom, I wrote this essay, and I want, I want you to read it. And I was like, oh, sure, please. Um, <laughs> and she handed it to me, and it was titled The Gift. And it... A 10-year-old wrote for her school, you had to write about a gift that people, she wishes people had, and she wrote about the gift of recovery. Oh, and she's good. 10, so she doesn't have stigma. She doesn't look at it good or bad. It's just her world. And so I encourage people, that's what it can look like. To her, my children look at me and think, wow, you've done these amazing things. And it's not bad. It's, it's amazing. And for her to be able to write it down, and her teacher, when I looked at the paper, all it said was, wow. <laughs> but, I mean, imagine what she that day introduced. Who knows? That teacher probably needed that. Mm -hmm. It was probably her husband or her, you know, it was something that it's like, whoa. And a 10-year-old feels <laughs> proud. And thinks it's a gift. And so that's what it does when you can talk about it with your children. You just, you talk about it. It's just every day, just normal. Just normal. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that, Pam. Right. Pam talked about the, um, the power in, like, not being anonymous and sharing your story. And obviously we do that quite regularly on this program. Um, I'd like to ask Riley, like, what, as an adolescent, right, in this high school, discovering, finding out that they're coming in to do a film on what you guys have going on. Like, what was, what was going through your mind at that time? Like, how were, what, where, where were you, like, mentally, like, finding out that they were doing that? How'd they pitch it to you? Like, I mean, so we all had, had forms to sign. Um, you know, when they, they, Sasha initially told us and, I mean, with, with things like that, there's always, you know, there's always skepticism with it. And I, at that time, had a lot of stuff going on. My um, stepdad, like, vaguely threatened to kill us. And so my family split up, and I was, like, living with my friend. And my mom was living with, like, some lady from church with my little brother. And so I had all this stuff going on, and I was like, I don't want these people filming me. Like, <laughs> like I don't know. Um, and so I think initially, like, I, I felt really, like, used. Um, that was my first thought was like, oh, cool, these people are using me. Um, and, you know, what I, I came to found out, like, after, after I saw it, I realized that that wasn't the case. You know, I was expecting them to make some kind of Sarah McLaughlin commercial where, where you know, there's, there's black and white and she's talking about saving these poor children. Um, and, and luckily <laughs> <Sorry>. that, <laughs> no, no, I mean, that was, that was what I thought. I was like, oh, my God, these people are making like this super weird, depressing documentary. Um, but that wasn't the case. And, um, you know, what I realized now, like moving here is that, you know, my story is one of, of hundreds and, you know, my story alone is, is different, but it's not unique necessarily. Um, and you know, just my story alone, like I have, um, the power to help people. Like I helped the school raise $83,000 by like telling my story and like going places and telling, you know, my experience to other people to something that they don't know, you know, I can, 
create money. I can like change people's minds, um, influence people to like be passionate about something like that's crazy. Um, and that's just me. Like there are so many people that do it way better. Uh, and there are so many people that, you know, do it across, across the country. I mean, I think Archway has been a really good kind of instigator of, of the conversation. Yeah. Pam, you saw the movie, right? And like your sister said, you, you're the type of person to take action, right? Many of us are in recovery are right? just how we do mm-hmm. things, but you're the type of person to take action. So where did you start? What was your first steps? How did you get to this point today where we're going to, you're going to be opening the doors in August? What's that? Almost two months away. Yep. So, um, one of the co-founders, Cause I, I, I would say that like, obviously like there's probably like a considerable amount of mothers out there that had the same experience that you did. I think Mary Ferrari, who we work with back home in Charlotte told a very similar story to see in that movie. Yeah. So yeah. like, you know, what, what'd you do? So one of the co-founders, um, is a superintendent here locally, um, in our County. And his knowledge and understanding of how it works and um, it, we descri- describe it as the coalition of the willing. Um, you just started finding people, listening to people would say, hey, you need to meet so-and-so. And uh, honestly, it was like connecting dots and having um, the school background, um, that kind of understanding was invaluable. Um, And it made it fun because, again, the coalition of the willing, all these people started to come together, and everyone was gifted differently. Everyone had a piece of the puzzle, um, and it was awesome. We were listening to each other. It was, um, you do this, I do this, and it just kept growing. And to me, I kept thinking it's much greater than what something massive is coming. and you either jump on or you get out of its way. And um, had an opportunity to meet the third co-founder. Uh, and it, it just, I don't know, it just started moving and growing. And people were receptive and wanted to help. And here, you do this and know this. And um, it just, it came out of nowhere. Um, and it was, fo- it was so, again, the day that uh, this, Lake Oswego School District unanimously voted it in. Um, I sat there again, crying, thinking, my dad's birthday, I'm, on, I'm sitting on the ground on which I was introduced to drugs and alcohol. And in my head, I, I thought, this is the best high I've ever had. Um, so in the zone, so, God, uniquely designed to experience what I was experiencing. And I was so grateful that I listened that I listened to people and that I just did what I was told. Hey, you need to meet so-and-so. And so I found them and would meet them. And wow, they were the missing piece. And, um, and it just seemed to get faster and bigger and better. And it, again, it was a great high. It still is a great high. Um, and to be able, I keep telling myself to write it down, write it down. Um, and I've documented, you know, pictures and different things and emails from people, um, and so, it, again, it's just, it's, you either jump on the train, because it's coming. Whatever it is, it's coming. So. How about the school board? Like, when you're pitching it to the school board, how receptive were they to, because you said they voted yes. una- unanimously to Every single it. one of them was like, yes, this. You know, and again, this is one of those things that it will take a while to educate people and for people to understand. Um, I have yet to meet anyone who's not like, Oh, this is so needed. This is, and people, and people yet. Visit Western North Carolina. We got a story for that. <laughs> yeah. You know, but it's, so everyone knows that it's necessary and that it's needed. But again, taking that first step to admit that it's you or your child um, is almost impossible. Um, and so that they were, you know, one of the board members um, said out loud, it, you know, and hi, uh, him being a school board member, He's like, this is one of the things I'm most proud of being part of. And so uh, I think that that was a, a feeling that so many people had that were touching it. Um, and, you know, and again, from the very beginning, having been to 
Houston to see the success of the school and the alternative peer groups, that was always something, you know, here we're going to duplicate it. And um, the alternative peer group locally, uh, Family Inspired Recovery, came out of nowhere. And again, having been able to watch all the signs and how the school came to life, I'm like, just go with it because it, obviously it needs to come and it came fast and furious. Um, but again, it's always a cool story and it, the, the dots were connected quickly and here we sit. Riley, were you working at the alternative peer group before you all met? Yeah, yeah. So I worked... Um, the one in Houston? The one in Houston. Yeah, but not here. No, no, you not here. You were a part I of the opening. Yes. Yeah, I helped here. him. Okay. Yep. It. So y'all connected and then yes. moved yes. forward with the yeah. opening. And that was one of the signs. Knowing that Riley was here, he's, again, you know, had lived it, worked in it, is the product of it. I'm the connector. I, I it's, it, you know, it's looking at Riley and saying, what do you need? What does it look like? And trusting, having faith. My tattoo is my sobriety date with faith. But having him just say to me, Pam, this is what it looks like. This is what we need. And then me doing my piece, which is, all right, let me find it and connect those dots. And so having him here is a blessing. And I've never seen eyes on an alternative peer group. I, that, you know, that's not my story, but I have faith um, and know just by meeting Riley that it, it's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing for parents to be able to have for their children. Um, and it's so he's kind of in charge. It's like, tell me what it looks like and I'll go find it. Well, how did you uh, you said all the school board members was, you know, all for it. So um, how did you like pitch this to him? Is there anything in particular that you feel like sold him on it or can you just explain that process? The truth. You? The truth. Um, it, just people sharing their truth. Um, Dr. Marv Seppala, who's the chief medical director of Hazleton, Betty Ford, um, we were able to meet him, and his story is phenomenal, by the way. He was the first young person to go to treatment in Minnesota, Hazleton, and uh, he was introduced to us through... Um, Tony Mann, who's one of the co-founders, and um, so he was on our board. And so having someone at that level, and again, I, I like to use Dr. Seppala's example, uh, at, you know, what we're capable of. He was a young man, at, I think 17, when he went into treatment, and he's like, what's the problem? And they're like, well, you have a drug problem. Oh, no, I don't have a drug problem. I'm fine. And today he is the gorilla. He felt passionately enough about this disease that he went to medical school and that, you know, he does what he does now and helps thousands of people and speaks about it publicly. And so he's on our board and that helped because his understanding of the landscape to be able to speak to people who may or may not have a clue, you know, and so what he says is important and he's been an incredible gift to us and um, being part, him being part of the team. Mm -hmm. And so it's finding people who have our pieces to the puzzle. And again, one of the gifts that we all understand about being a person in recovery, we tell the truth. And when, when we hear the truth, we know it. And so I, I think that the school board, it's like they heard the truth and they were brave enough to jump. So I honor them for doing that. We uh we had a conversation with um a principal back home on a reservation and uh, everything was going really well. We started to have a get the conversation started about a recovery high school. And uh the school board eventually stepped up and was like there will never be a recovery high school here. Um and a lot of their reasons was well, one of the reasons was like uh what you're doing is you're showing preference over the students that have a drug problem. What about the students that don't have, that are doing all the right things? That's one of the school boards, that, that's one of their opinions, you know, that's their take on it, perspective. And Sounds like they're good where they're at. I mean, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Is that a problem, that they're doing well? Um, so that that's kind of the, the thinking that we're up against back at home, you know, we've got a lot of the school board. And maybe, it, I don't, I don't, I don't know how we would, change that perspective you know what I mean like well I, I look at um, similar what about diabetic camps 
do we say, well, that's not fair, because us sitting at the table, we're not diabetic. Well, that's not fair. We, why do they get that camp and we don't? It's like it's changing the mindset to mm -hmm. what is already happening in other arenas. And so I, I try to look at different models um, that, that we can copy and that it, that it works. I mean, how I remember watching a movie uh, and they, they were going to talk about cancer. And one of the characters said, when my mom says the word cancer, she whispers it. And so because, again, we didn't want to say oh, they have cancer. You know, like it's today we we lean in and help each other when someone has cancer. You know, we're like, oh, let me help you. How can I help you? Um, we need to emulate that and mm -hmm. not whisper or not totally ignore the animal sitting at the table whose head is on the table. Um, we just have to start copying different models. And that I would encourage you to do that. You know, look around your community and, you know, and try to say to them, listen, because X, Y, and Z. I mean, I'd be happy to help and just look at your community and who's there. I think what we're doing right now, too, these kind of conversations, you know, someone who's been there, has walked through the line, you know, and is a product of it, is going to help, too, shed in light on these different things. I hope that one day it'll open the eyes in our community because, you know, when I think 14 years old, overdosing you know it's pretty it's pretty scary so I just hope that one day they'll be able to uh, they'll be able to uh, to get on the same page accept yeah accept it and what's going on because it's it's all over it's very prevalent and on our reservation especially you know you were talking about that entitlement and uh, tell them about what we get the we get uh, a per capita check twice a year um, for roughly around fifty five hundred dollars six thousand dollars it just depends and uh, during that time overdose rates just skyrocket I'm sure on our uh, reservations and when they from the age of when we're born until we're 18 those per capita Two checks months. get put into a minor trust fund so by the time <laughs> they're gr by the time they turn 18 y y to get it when you're 18 you have to graduate or you have to wait till you're 21 but still yet you know that money accumulates and it becomes like in the hundred thousands oh, it's of dollars a winner. and then you hand it to a, to a child i'm sorry when you're 18 years old you still have not li I, you haven't lived enough life to be able to make um uh, you go through it quickly. Good investments, yeah. you know, to, to have understanding of how to properly use an amount of money like that, you know, and, and it just is very destructive. I and mean, I would imagine you have a young person who has a drug or alcohol problem. Yeah. That's a death sentence. Absolutely. That's like, that's going face in. Yeah. And so it's really hard. I mean, it is scary. We've lost a lot of people because of that. You know, I know a lot of people that have, uh, I, I blew my entire check on on drugs for sure yeah, well, yeah and i mean i think the you know the powerful thing about death is how it brings people together um yes. and i think you know having having those parents and those families like show up to the school board and be like there's a drug mm -hmm. problem here whether or not you admit it like you know there's a graveyard you can look mm -hmm. um you know you can see that like dying at 30 dying at 18 dying at 16 like that's not normal Right. That's right. Um, and the fun thing about school boards is that they're elected officials. Uh, <laughs> so you can just <laughs> precisely you can, you can just remind them of that um, and be like, is this how you know, is this how you want to present? Like, do you want to help solve a problem or do you want to do business as usual? And I find that, you know, most of the time when it comes to stepping up, there's at least one. And that's all it takes. Mm -hmm. Well, this we're talking big numbers, the people that uh, it's like one out of 10 people have it. So it's like, this isn't something we need to talk about it. It's, it's too big. It's too big. And again, it's a preventable disease. And until we understand that, yeah. um, we have to find supports for people because I mean, the day that I got sober, um, you know, learning that there are four ways out, death, jail, insanity, or sobriety, 
Uh, and like you said earlier, when you're trying to think, well, jail or treatment, I mean, we actually have to think about it. Yeah. I mean, I sat and thought about it. It's like, hmm, well, and knowing that the answer is sobriety, but it's hard. But ed educating people, all of us who are in recovery, it's important. I, I share whenever I can to whoever I can. Because, mm -hmm. you know, again, I want people to understand this is what it looks like. Do I want it? No. No. But I'm sure the person who is diabetic or has cancer doesn't want that either. Um, but, it, you know, I have this. And so I live with it, and I love paying it forward. I mean, so that's kind of the, the good part. Aren't you glad that you didn't trust your first instinct and feel emotion? <laughs> like whenever, like whenever they introduced this video or this movie to you, this documentary, and you was like, "Oh, there." What? How? How'd you explain that again? What do you think it was doing? Uh, like a Sarah McLaughlin commercial. <laughs> you know where she's like in the arms. Right. Of the so, so, um, but stepping into that, like getting out of your comfort zone and being a part of this, like how has that inspired you along your journey? Now that have, now that you've seen the fruit of this documentary and what it's inspired across the country. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, it's just the realization that like, all of us that were there during the documentary, all of us that were there before and after, like, you know, we all have stories and connections and the ability to like change communities. And we're, you know, across the country, there's some of us in Texas a lot, you know, California, Oregon, uh, New York, Canada, Mexico, you know, and it's like we're we're everywhere now, and we're the really great things about alternative peer groups and recovery high schools is it's it's like a generational fix. So people <laughs> people get sober, they go out, and they come back, and they're like, "Hey, here's a better way to do this." So Hannah Milne, who's in the documentary, um, created her own alternative peer group, mm -hmm. Keystone, which mm -hmm. is different than the one Pam and I made, families inspired family inspired recovery. Um, and so for us, it's like it's this great thing where we go through it, we see what needs to change, we see what works. Adapt it to your community. Yeah, and we're able to also relate to those experiences and help other people with that as well. What kind of response have you received since this thing opened in May? I mean, it's always, I would say as far as support goes, people have been generous, definitely. Um, but it's one of those things about changing conversations. Yeah, awesome. You know? Just, yeah. The connections that's how it works. made, yeah. <laughs> So cool. Yeah, and it's, you know, there's there's definitely a lot of resistance here. Um, you know, there's a reason that Oregon is the worst state. It doesn't. It didn't just kind of happen to be. Um, you know, Oregon created a, a flawed system that works and benefits people who continue to feed that system. Like it's cyclical. It's a cyclical mess. So, for us, coming with something new and not taking business as usual for an answer and being like, this is how we're going to do it, and you know, it'll work. And in the meantime, you're just going to have to bear through it. What kind of, uh, so how does, how does a student or a parent get their kid into, into your school here at Harmony Academy? What does that process look like? So right now, um, the website for the school. Um, Give it up. Yeah, go ahead and Harmony drop a plug. Harmony Academy, R-H-S. Dot org. Dot org. Um, they can go on there and uh, Sharon um, Dersey Martin, who is our new principal, um, all that information will go to her. And, uh, it's, again, it's one of those things that's trying to educate and explain to people. This is not, the school's not a punishment. You're not getting sent here. This is an opportunity. You get to learn tools and be, find a community and the support that's needed. And, uh, I look at it. I found the sign, um, that reads home because, Again, I can't even say it without crying. I look at, it as, look at it as an opportunity for these young people to come home, to find your tribe, and to be, to be able to look at each other. Uh, Tony and I, who, uh, again, went to high school and are, are two of the co-founders, we've laughed and cried about the people that should have been here with us. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just, it's wonderful. And again, that's a, from an adult perspective. So my dream this entire time has been to create this environment that I, like Riley, would have been kicking and screaming going in, <laughs> but eventually it would have been like, ah, okay, this is okay. Because um, I've always known I'm different, 
but it wasn't different bad. It was different good. Mm -hmm. And so. I think one of the amazing things with teenagers is that this is the only time in somebody's life that you can be like, you're going to treatment. Right. Yeah. Like you don't have a choice. Right. And that's, yep. that's crazy. Like that's insane. My life, you know, had I been 18 or had there not been anything around me, mm -hmm. I would have just continued. And then, you know, where I was, there was no way that you were telling me to like go to treatment. Absolutely not. Um, but with teenagers, as a parent, you have the ability to be like, this is what we're doing. Yep. Right. And you don't have a choice. And had Houston not had the resources available, who knows where you would have ended up. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. yeah. The alternative peer group, Family Inspired Recovery. Um, there's the website, familyinspiredrecovery.org. Um, we'll have information. People can call. We have open um, group meetings on Thursday evenings for parents, for teens, and then for children of or siblings of. Um, and they're you know similar to the 12 step um, 12 step groups. Uh, but it's an opportunity for people to come and check it out. And it's just, and again, it's spreading the word. People will have to hear about the school and the alternative peer group uh, hundreds of times before the brain actually registers, oh, what is that? And I want the word spread enough so that that, because I'm always after the one, the one person who needs it, who doesn't know it exists. And so I want as many people as possible to know that these services <clears throat> and supports exist so that when they find that brave moment that they can say out loud something is wrong, um, that someone next to them who loves them will say, hey, I know of a place and hope and healing exists there. Mm -hmm. And so again, it's just getting the word out you know, as fast and as furious as we can. So, Go ahead, so can you kind of explain like to listeners who don't really know what a recovery high school is, just the kind of walk them through how, like, how do you progress, like, um, academically, and then also with your recovery, you know, how do you evaluate that and analyze that, and those type of things? I'll let you jump in. Yeah, so, so I think a lot of the conversation with recovery high schools and kind of helping people understand um, is just listing things that it's not. So it's not a boarding school. Um, it's not a uh, school that provides therapy uh, as much as it is a high school that supports recovery. Yeah. Um, so there, as far as like, you know, the days go, it's like you're still getting a high school diploma. So I got my high school diploma. It didn't say Archway Academy. It said, um, I think it was like Phoenix High School or something. Um, so because there is still a stigma, like, kids aren't gonna have this branding of like, I went to a recovery high school. Um, you know, it's gonna be, for Harmony, it's gonna be a Lake Oswego diploma. Um, yeah. What about well, cur cur curriculum? Yeah, that's stuff. what I was gonna is ask. That, curriculum, so, so um, Harmony is a charter school, and so curriculum is, you know, what the, the curriculum is for that district. Um, it's okay. the same for any high school. Um, you know, I was able to, go through college and graduate based on my archway education so people can do it too and there's Beautiful. online opportunities you know cool. there there each student's going to come in with a different background and different classes and things that worked and didn't work and so it's an opportunity uh to some students are gonna have to do some recovery work i mean actual re you know uh credit um and so maybe some of that's online um it just lots of different ways to accommodate getting them graduated. And it's not an alternative education. You know, they get, it, just like Riley s shared, uh, Lake Oswego. So it's not like you have this scarlet letter that says, you're from this recovery high school. No one will know. And again, I look at it as a badge of honor anyway, so. Mm. Right. Um, collegiate recovery programs. Yeah. Um, you know, you talked about like the continuum of care and it, like these recovery high schools just being kind of a natural funnel to the masses of collegiate recovery programs that are opening up nationwide. Like what kind of relationship do you have like with any of the university programs? And then also like were you involved in any type of collegiate recovery when you went to college? So, yeah, I think the the really amazing thing about Archway is we had college day. So we had they came to you. <laughs> yeah. So we had six <laughs> different colleges come and just talk about their recovery programs. Um, so 
I went to U of H and University of Houston, and they have a collegiate recovery program. So I went from high school to a collegiate recovery program, and I was able to have like awesome. everybody's normal high school experience. Like I went to parties, I like tailgated with friends, I stayed up too late. I failed out of some classes, like, you know, everybody's experience with college, like I had that just like minus drugs and alcohol. Um, the year after I left, which I'm upset about, they climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. Uh, I was like, yeah, no, it's insane. That's a good <laughs> and I'm really upset. Uh, John Shiflett, if you're listening, I, uh, you owe me a trip to Africa. So. <laughs> Can you bike? Um, <laughs> Do you want to buy? Are you teachable? <laughs> they got 250 miles tomorrow, man. I'm, I'm teachable, but <laughs> not 250 miles. Of teachable. Uh, I want to ask about like the day to day. How's it going to go here? The operations. What, what What does a day look like in Harmony Academy? What is that? It's hard to say right now because Sharon, um, who is the principal, mm -hmm. uh, will start July one. Um, one of the the Association of Recovery Schools. Uh, which Sasha McLean, you know, leads. Mm -hmm. um, they have so much information. And again, I, we all experience how generous and supportive people are in the recovery communities. Um, they, they have been incredibly generous. Like, here's all the curriculums of all these different schools. And so right now we're going through that process. How, what works for this area? What, what will work for the students? Because um, they're People have been so incredibly generous from the other recovery high schools across the country. It's like you going through a buffet. It's, it's like, wow, all these really cool ways of doing things. And then you figure out, you know, the district here and what are the supports that you already have here and, and you build it. So it's, um, I, we should let Riley kind of discuss. We visited one time to Archway Academy and, and, you know, spent the whole day there and watched and it, Felt like high school, except that they started off together in a group meeting, and um, which was Beautiful. the coolest thing I've uh, experienced. And um, watching these young people own who they were and uh, talk about where the, their state of mind for that that day, so that they could progress through the day. Um, and then that when we visited. Um, males and females we separated after our big group and I sat with these young women and we checked in and, and you had to affirm yourself and affirm the person to your left um, and I'm not kidding you by the time it got to me listening to these young women I mean at the time you know I was like 45 years old 46 I, I, I was bawling to be able to have those tools to be taught those tools and to practice them over and over again um, I, but again, but by, by the time it got to me, I was like, boop, I'm a wreck, <laughs> you know, and, and to, again, to be able to affirm yourself out loud and have that be normal, like I'm good at this and to be able to say it to the person next to you, it was an amazing gift and they do that every day. So, but it felt like high school kids That's walking awesome. around. For sure. It looked like it. Yeah. It it yeah. I couldn't tell. Yeah. Them, no. I mean, it is, it is a normal high school. We start there obviously differences. So we start every day off with a check-in. Um, so, and it's it split up a couple of different ways. There's guys and girls check-in some days, there's small groups, there's one big check-in. Um, and, you know, we talk about what's going on, other kids give feedback, and that's kind of, you know, your opportunity to like start the morning off. Um, and also from a staff perspective, it's a chance for us to kind of see where you're at. Um, and then we go throughout school. They have uh, recovery coaches at Archway. So if there's a day when you're triggered or, or just a day when something's going on, like life happens when you're in recovery, regardless of how long you have. That's just part of it. So if you need to talk to somebody about something, you can, um, you know, go, go to the teacher and be like, hey, I need to go to support. And you'd be able to go down and, like, talk to one of the recovery coaches, like, hey, this is what's going on right now, and this is how I'm feeling about it. And they can be like, do you want to talk to your sponsor? In which case, like, they can pull your sponsor out of class. And, like, they probably don't do this anymore, but it used to be that, like, I could, like, go to Starbucks with my sponsor for, like, an hour and just talk about whatever. Or, like, they would call my counselor at the APG, and they would be like, it sounds like, you know, Riley needs to have a family session. 
Uh, so by the time I left school, I was going to a family session uh, to like talk to my parents about something. Um, or if like it was a particularly bad day, which like I've had before, I was able to like go to my APG early and like meet with my counselor um, and like the therapist there and just kind of like talk about what's going on um, and be able to just like hang out there because like I need space. So yeah. That's the stuff that I think is amazing is, you know, you, you take these young adolescents whose brains are developing and you have them wrapped every single day mm -hmm. by people who love and care and want to support them. And so for a young person, again, we all use for different reasons. And if I'm tired or if I'm angry and, you know, your immediate thought is, well, I want to blah, 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 to be able, again, to be taught that it's okay to ask out loud, hey, I need some help, I need some support. That person then to, to think through for you what the rest of the day is going to look like, be able to call the counselor for the after-school APG piece and say, hey, hey, heads up, Riley's coming, he's tired, he's got blah, 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 and, you know, needs to have a family session. I mean, imagine to have that love and support around you. And... For these young people that attend both schools and alternative peer groups, you're t that's a significant amount of time that they are in an environment that is rewiring the brain or giving it new information on how things, uh, you know, to be able to support you so you can thrive and knock it out of the park. At a critical point in their yes. life when their brain's developing. Yes. And also, like, I hear what I'm hearing is uh, creating a really solid culture of like trust and honesty where you would feel comfortable to like mm -hmm. hit go over there early and feel comfortable to have that honest conversation with your counselor about whatever it is that's going on. Or even like, the family session. Or the you family know, session. Having like, that safe yeah. environment. 16 year old Steve's like, get the fuck out yeah, of here. Yeah, I'm, like, try, I'm trying to talk to my, or, yeah. or like for me, like, I can't talk to my parents about this. Hell I'm going to no. get in trouble. Oh, you know, oh, but yeah, then you create right. that safe space. Yep. And it's not as scary, yep. you know. Or and for the not. parent, it's not as scary because yeah. when you yeah. hear things from your kids, y you immediately react, and it, a lot of times it's fear-based. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. And and yeah. to be able to have someone in the room going, "Hey, Pam, relax. Hear your son out. Hear your daughter yeah. out. It's going to be okay." Because you know, we parents we want to fix it. Oh, let <laughs> me. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And usually it's not correct because we're, you know, reacting emotionally instead yeah. of thoughtful and, you know, what's the outcomes. But, yeah, to be able to have someone say, sit down, it's going to be okay. Yeah, and, and I think that's... Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. I think that's something that's, you know, really critical about the APG piece of it is, like, that's the parent part. So my mom, who was... She was kind of in denial. She didn't know what to do, but she's just naturally like a really teachable she like wants to learn things all the time and so you know we developed a family contract of like these are the rules these are what happens if you break them these are the rewards that you get if you don't mm -hmm. um, my mom went to like parents group and learned about like setting appropriate boundaries and all of this stuff and and anytime there was a difficult conversation that I was like I don't feel like I can have it right now um, and you know that works two ways we were both able to be like hey, I'm feeling really upset and I don't want to say something that I'm going to regret. Um, are you okay if we, like, talk about this at a later point? Uh, and that, you know, that those communication skills are, are amazing. And I think that everybody deserves to, like, have that opportunity. Which, by the way, um, spending, you know, this last uh, several months with Riley, some of the things that come out of his mouth uh, blow me away in a positive way because you can see how that's how he processes it and it's a very healthy way and it, it's like he nips things quickly and he wants to talk about it and I'm 50 years old and there are some things I'm like whoa I'm not even close to mature enough and he's just calm and says it and it, it's like wow yeah. and so it's so impressive to be able to have that that comes to him naturally like at least it looks like it's natural. <laughs> you may nope. be freaking out inside. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it kind of reiterates back to that point where, you know, you were talking about, like, being a teenager, you have that ability to be a, like, no, you're going to treatment. Whereas as an adult, it's a lot harder to instill, even for parents. You know, mm -hmm. I've seen parents, their kids, are, they're adults. You know, they're 30 something years old still using drugs still living at wood and they don't know how to comprehend it they don't know how to um 
how to handle it, you know. Right. But then reiterating back to the, you know, um, getting involved in a school like this or being able to um, work on these skills as a young young adult, as a teenager is... Yeah. I look at the... And that's why I love prevention. Um, so many of us, again, start using so young. And I look at it as an opportunity to be able to identify it faster and nip it faster. Um, for example, and this is my addict brain thinking, but if we were able to catch someone at 14, and at 14, our brains do what's called, it prunes itself. It gets rid of a lot of the information that it has because it doesn't need it anymore. It doesn't need to learn to crawl or walk or, you know, or uh, talk. And so it has to prepare itself for the adult world coming. And so again, it prunes. So at 14, our brains are, you know, this wide open space. And what also starts at 14, a lot of times, well, drug and alcohol use. But if, so if we could nip it to a 14-year-old and say, listen, getting suspended from school three times, all indirectly related to drugs, is not normal. You might, let's talk about it and find supports. Because what if we could take that 14-year-old, and again, this is speaking to the addict piece, but what if we could find the supports for this young person for the next 10 years, what if they get to use? What if on the end, they get to, and it's normal because the brain has developed. And again, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a doctor, I'm just wishing. Like, that could be a motivator to a young person. Like, listen, l let us find the supports for you. Just so that, because right now it's not working. And guess what, it's a progressive thing, it gets worse. You just have to trust me on it. And that's where people like yeah. Riley comes in because he's, looks like you know more relatable did you say after 10 years like they they can't because they develop the skills they get to use well the brain the well the brain will develop the way it's yeah, supposed yeah. to yeah, yeah and so they say you know at 14 the brain starts to prune mm -hmm. um and then the brain is fully developed around the age of 25 uh so yeah no i totally get it but i think like after having those supports in place what you end up getting is this yeah, right. Exactly right. Right. And again, but to be able to say to this young person you know kind of selling to their yeah, yeah. the wanting to use so mm -hmm. bad at 14 it's like maybe you're gonna get to but let's let us help you you know get to this age mm -hmm. or one day at a time because again at 14 you're like don't talk about 25 because yeah. that <laughs> doesn't exist Ooh. um but to be able to say listen maybe you're gonna get to let us help you get to that point because chances are by the time like Riley, at 24, it's like, I'm not going to, uh-uh. But, but he has the material. He has the brain development. All these things that make him who he is today. Um, chances are people are going to be like, uh, I'm not doing that. But let's give him the opportunity to get there first. Mm -hmm. um, but I look at it that way. I'm like, God, what if you got to? <laughs> who knows? We need some of these peer groups in our community yeah. because yes. yeah. culturally and traditionally at Native Americans, you got so much... The, the trauma, domestic violence, all these different things, yeah. substance use, mental health, it's more prevalent, right? And I think that uh, especially providing the family with the skill set of mm -hmm. learning how to communicate, supporting your child, having these conversations, it would be a, a game changer for yes. mm -hmm. for our, our reservation. And reservations across the country because culturally we're not supposed to talk about things like that. Like, you, it's a bad thing if you show weakness, you know, as, as a Native American man especially. When do you guys... Nara, what, what um, you, we're going to connect you with that. There, Let's do it. Um, what is the, what's it stamp? I'm not sure what the uh, abbreviation is for. Um, we'll look it up later and I'll give it to you. Um, right. You need to meet them. They're right. a Native American recovery organization. Yep. They, they do a lot of great work. Okay. Yep. You know, are y'all familiar with Don Coyus? Mm-mm. Mm -mm. Okay, we'll have to. You have to check him out, too. Kay. He does some great work as Kay. well. Well, listen, guys. This has been... I, I love about it. cry. I don't know how many times <laughs> I'm over here trying great to keep it Great conversations. Don't feel bad. <laughs> yeah. We greatly appreciate the invitation. Riley, your story is an inspiration. Yes. Can't wait, I can't wait to see what you know the next steps are for the school and the type of impact that you guys are going to make in the community. 
Um, and I can't wait to come back next year. And yeah, see hopefully, this place yeah. Open. We yeah. can facilitate yeah. us coming back and for hanging sure. out with you yeah. guys. For sure. <laughs> I for just, sure. I really want to give you a shout out for, you know, hitting on the fact like at first you thought, wow, these people are here to use me, you know, and, and then, and, but, you know, it's not that at all. There's so much power in sharing your story, and that's what we try to share with people, you know, especially mm-hmm. on this podcast, especially in our community with the things that we do is just how, like, it's not for anything for our pleasure or for personal anything gain. that, yeah, personal gain for us. Like, we just want people to get their stories out there because there's so much power in it. And, I mean, you've inspired me, both of you, and I just can't even imagine the adolescents that might hear this that is going to inspire them. So thank you so much for sharing your story. Well, thank, thank you for you. having us. Yeah, Go ahead and throw us a plug. How can people connect with the school one Teenagers. more time? <laughs> Website, social media, whatever. All right. Uh, so school is Harmony Academy. The website is harmonyacademyrhs.org. And then our program, Family Inspired Recovery, is an alternative peer group. And it's um, famincsrec.org, F-A-M-I-N-S-R-E-C.org. Beautiful. Yep. Y'all Thank are you. awesome. Thank you so yeah, much. Thanks for having us. Thank you guys. Bye, guys. Bye, bye, bye. Later. Later. Bye. bye.